Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew 1, 18. This is going to be a text that you're going to think, Greg, wait a minute. What time of year is it here? Okay? But don't worry. It's going to be all right. This is going to be a point of departure, something sort of a topic today that God has given me more than going through the text in detail. Matthew 1, 18 says the following. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Wait a minute. It's snowing, so we're going to get in the Christmas kind of mood, right? His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Why don't you just sort of catch a little bit of the vibe there? Emphasis. Before they came together. Emphasis. She was found out to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, a righteous man, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had it in mind to divorce her quietly. In those days, a betrothal was, was marriage commitment, really, so there would need to be a divorce. Verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you came to be among us, Emmanuel, God among us. Oh, Jesus, it never gets old, Lord God. It never gets old that you came to visit humanity, Lord, and that you became one of us. And Lord, I thank you for the way that you did that, Lord, and for the human drama involved and the way that speaks to us about what it means to be part of your story. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us today. You're the good shepherd. We haven't come here by accident. We're here today for a purpose. And I pray that we would hear the voice of the shepherd in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As I prayed, what struck me in this text, as I, I, I like to listen to the Bible on my, on my phone, plug it into the car, and I listen to it, and I was hearing this. What struck me as I heard it this, a couple weeks ago was the story that goes behind the birth of Jesus, the human drama behind the story. Now, you may have reflected on this before, but you know the story that an angel visited Mary, right? Tells her she will conceive a child. She says, how will this be? I, I'm, I'm a virgin. And, and the angel says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and come upon you, and you will conceive a child that will be the Son of God. And she submits to that, and she says, let it be to me as you have, have said. Now, what I would like to see happen, if I were God, I would right away send that angel down the street to Joseph's house to tell him, hey, Joseph, I got something to tell you. Mary's going to be pregnant, but it's okay, because it's from the Holy Spirit. Really, you need to, I would, I would do all that that night right away, Right? If, if, if it were me, but uh, it's not me, and that's a good thing, because God's smarter than I am. But the angel didn't do that right away. Maybe he got stuck in traffic, you know, I don't know. But he didn't get over to Joseph's house, and it wasn't even for a day or two, but after a while, she was found to be pregnant. Now, I don't know how much time went by if she was showing, but a long time, too much time, went by in between her getting pregnant miraculously and Joseph getting this visit from the angel. You ever notice that? And Joseph, did you imagine how Joseph feels? You ever thought about that? 
you know, she's pregnant. Imagine him, he's in the wood shop talking to his buddies, you know, about the Super Bowl and everything, and then, but then it turns to other topics, and he's like, uh, she's pregnant. What? What are you talking about? Who's the father? She says, it's God. Ah. She says, it's God. She seemed like such a good woman, a woman of God. She seemed, everything seemed good. Could you imagine the sleepless nights that Joseph went through? The emotional agony? I just wondered, God, how could this be? I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. She was such a good woman. She loves God. And why would she make up this story? Has she gone nuts? He doesn't believe her. Of course, no. Why would anyone? I mean, that's... And he goes through this torture, and he finally decides, because according to the law, he, 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 well, he knows he needs to divorce her. That's, right? That's obvious. He, he can't marry a woman who's been unfaithful to him. That's, but according to the law, she could be publicly exposed. She could be removed from the synagogue, re- exiled from the community. She could be even worse. You know, we saw the story of the woman caught in adultery, right? Where they were going to stone her. And, uh, and Jesus said, let, let the one without sin cast the first stone. So God wasn't into that, really, but, but people could have done that. And Joseph decided, well, what am I going to do? Finally, he comes to a decision. I love this woman. I obviously can't marry her, but I don't want to expose her to public disgrace. I'm going to find a way to do this quietly so that hopefully she can just get on with her life somehow, but I don't want to see her getting hurt. Then the angel visits him and explains the whole story after he had considered all this. After he had come to a decision, the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is really from the Holy Spirit. I added the really, but that's what's going on. And then he goes on to tell the story. Now, why did God make Joseph suffer like that? Why did he allow him this agony? Is God being cruel to him? Well, he's being tough. Because what happened was Joseph was being tested. Joseph was being tested. And really, the answer is, Joseph, guess what? You have just been through the biggest test of your life up to now and you get an A. Because your impulse was to be faithful to God, but also to protect this woman. And I, if I'm going to pick a man to raise my son on earth, he better be someone who's reliable. He better be someone whose first impulse is to protect that baby and that baby's mother. And you have, I have tested you, and you have proven that you are the man for the job. You've shown that you are qualified for this. Now, didn't God already know that? I mean, that's why God picked him in the first place. But maybe Joseph needed to know that. Maybe Mary needed to know that, because this wasn't going to be the last test. There were going to be other tests There was going to be a time when they had to travel when she was nine months pregnant to to Bethlehem and where there wasn't going to be any room in the inn and they were going to have to be in a cave and they were going to have to put the baby in a a feeding uh, manger trough. And, And then he was going to have to flee to Egypt and protect the mother and the baby and run as a fugitive in Egypt because Herod was trying to kill him. He was going to be tested. And he was going to need to be strong, he was going to need to be courageous, and he was going to need to have a drive to protect this woman and this baby. And he needed to prove it to himself, to Mary, and to all the angels and principalities that he had what it takes to do what he needed to do. He needed to build muscles of love, muscles of faith, the power and the courage to do what God had called him to do. And it would be impossible for him to fulfill his mission of greatness without being tested. And that's what I want to talk about today, that God tests his people. The crucible for silver, it says in Proverbs 17.3, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Anyone here enjoy tests? Don't raise your hand. 
There's two or three of you. There's two or three of you in school. You were that kid who enjoyed the test. Most people don't like tests, okay? So don't. But some people, testing is hard. Now, here's the deal. The devil tests us as traps. He tests us in ways that he hopes we're going to fail, right? But God's tests are set up for us to shine and for us to succeed. He will let you get behind 25 points in the fourth quarter to show that you're the greatest. I don't know, just in case anyone's thinking about that still. He tests us to train us. He tests us to teach us. In Spanish, no puede ser comprobado si no ha sido probado primero. You can't be proven until you're tested. And your faith needs to be tested. So you're learning to rely on God and discover that he is reliable. And you can't discover that without going through hard times in which you need to rely on him. And he comes through for you. And you say, wow, God came through for me then. Maybe he can do it again. And it builds and it builds and it builds until you have strong faith. But that can't happen unless you go through training. And God's training is his testing. Amen? What about when we fail a test? What about when we fail? Because we do fail some tests. Anyone here ever been tested and fallen on your face? Okay, yeah, yeah I think some of us didn't <laughs> know. Yeah, yeah, been there, done that. Not too long ago, people are thinking. Peter, think about Peter. Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Can you imagine that going to his head a little bit? I'm the rock. You know, it's like the name for a boxer, right? I'm the rock. Jesus said, you will sit on thrones beside me, judging the 12 tribes of Israel when, when the kingdom of God comes on earth. And I could just see Peter being like, yeah, Jesus, he's on the throne, but I'm right next to him. Peter needed a little humble pie, all of the apostles. And Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, in other words, we're going to put the Peter name aside for a second, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, all of you, as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers." How is Peter going to reply to this? What do you think? He said, yeah, I know I'm going to blow it, Lord. I, I'm pretty weak. I, I know I'm not very strong, and I'm capable of denying you. Do you think that's what he's going to say? Say, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. <laughs> and Jesus is just shaking his head. I tell you, Peter, before the crow crows today, rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know me. Now, other gospels say he goes on insisting, no, really, no, I'll, even if everyone else denies you, I'll die for you. Peter needed a little humble pie. He needed a coach that lets him get beaten up into the ground so that he realizes where he's really at. And ironically, Peter's sin prepared him to be a better shepherd of sinners, right? Can you imagine if he had never blown it, if he'd never denied the Lord three times, every time a person comes with struggle, well, just get your act together, be like me, the rock. But no, he knew we're all in this together. Anyone God is going to use, he's going to break. He's going to test you and he's going to let you fall on your face sometimes so you know your frailty and you know your weakness. Now, sometimes God lets us fail a test because we build strength through it. There's a great story about the prophet Jeremiah. If you've never read the Old Testament in the prophets, prophet Jeremiah is one of my favorites. Because in the book of Jeremiah, you read his personal journals, where he writes things that he's saying to God. He writes down some of his prayers, and he writes down some of God's answers to him. And he's a prophet, so we know it's God talking. 
Now, Jeremiah was called at a time when the whole nation was in rebellion against God. And Jeremiah was called to be a one-man army saying, you're all in sin. You need to repent. God's going to send your enemies. And he was called to be a voice in the wilderness, all alone against a whole nation. He was accused of being a traitor. His destiny was to suffer more than any of the other prophets. He's really a type of Christ in that sense. He was beaten up in the courtyard. He appeared before kings. At one point, he was thrown into a well, and he sunk into mud. There was one particular prison cell he was in, in the household of someone named Jonathan. They're, you Jonathans are usually good in the Bible, but that one must have been bad. He was in this, he suffered terribly, terribly. Now, early on in his ministry, he was discouraged because people weren't listening to him, and the bad guys seemed to be winning. Everyone was listening to the false prophets. And so Jeremiah complains to the Lord. Anyone here ever complained to the Lord when you're failing a test? You ever write down, God, why? And you kind of blame him. Why did you do this to me? Well, Jeremiah did this. He said in Jeremiah chapter 12, if you're taking notes, you are always righteous, Lord, yet I would speak with you about your justice. In other words, sometimes I wonder if you're fair, right? He says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? And yet you know me. You see me. You test all my thoughts about you. And then God explains. And he said, Jeremiah, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, How can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? Jeremiah, what makes you think you can run with horses when you can't keep up with people? This is easy. This is nothing compared to what you're going to face someday. And if I don't let you get pushed and fail now, you're not going to be strong enough to fulfill what I called you to do when things really get tough. This is nothing. I need to strengthen you now. And God warns him, it's going to get harder, and you need to get stronger. You need to get tougher. Your own relatives, members of your own family, Jeremiah, verse 6, even they have betrayed you. Don't trust them, though they speak well of you. See, Jeremiah needed to get deeper. He needed to get stronger. And God does that with us because he's called you to do great things. And it's going to be tough. And there might be hard times. And there will be temptations and challenges. And God is going to give you tests now so that you'll be able to pass the big ones later. Amen? He is a trainer. And he is committed to deepening your soil. Testing is the way God sees to it that our roots go deep and that we're not shallow Christians. Listen to this. In the parable of the seeds and the soils, Jesus said that there were some people who are like rocky ground, right? And he said those on the rocky ground are the people who receive the word of God with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They're shallow. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they will fall away. And God doesn't want you to fall away. So he is going to push. He's going to test like a good coach. I understand there are certain sports teams that make their players practice in the elements. It's cold out there. It's slushy. It's snowy. It's miserable. Get out there. Now's the time you need to be there more than ever because it's in the hard times that your roots are going to go deep. Very, very deep. And so God uses trials of many kinds. He puts you in situations and then tests your reaction. What are you going to do? Sometimes they may be decisions. God has given you clear instructions about what his will is in the word of God. And then he puts you in situations where you're tempted to go against those instructions. So what are you going to do? Here's an example of it. It's, it's a little bit different. But it's kind of an example. Pastor Roberto, a couple years ago, preached out of Jeremiah 35, where Jeremiah called a group of people called the Rechabites. Okay? These were people who were descended from a certain guy named Rechab. Okay? And that ancestor had made a covenant with the Lord. He said, God, if you will bless my family, 
My descendants will never drink wine or live in houses. They'll live in tents, and they're going to be teetotalers. Okay? And all of his descendants said, you know what? Let's do that. We're going to obey the instructions of our great-great-grandfather, Rechab. And they didn't drink wine, and they lived in tents. They had to come to Jerusalem because of the war going on against Babylon at the time. They're in Jerusalem, and God tells Jeremiah, call the Rechabites into a courtroom of the temple. So you've got the prophet Jeremiah inviting you to the temple, sit them down at the table, put good wine in front of them, and command them, drink. Can you imagine? You are under oath not to drink wine. And the prophet Jeremiah puts a glass before you and says, drink. And they're like, Mr. Jeremiah, we know you're a prophet. But our ancestor put us under oath. We, we made a promise to God that we can't break. A plus. They kept the instructions. And God uses that as an example for the people of Israel of obedience. When God gave manna in the wilderness to the people of Israel, the Bible clearly says, I will give bread from heaven, and the people are to go out and gather enough for each day, one day, just enough for one day. And God says, in this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions or not. Now, they were hungry. They're in the desert. Get what they did. They gathered up all the bread and tried to save it for the next day, and it turned moldy and rotten. And God said, I, you guys, I told you enough for one day. Ten times he tested them. Ten times they tested him in the desert. We're going to talk about that. They didn't follow the instructions of the Lord. I want to be, when I grow up, like the Rechabites. I want to be the kind of person who says, the word of God says this. Amen? And the devil's going to say, but there's an easier way. Now, this happened to Jesus. If Jesus was tested, uh, don't think you and I won't be. Right? The spirit drove him into the desert where he would be tempted by the devil for 40 days. The devil came up to him and said, if you really are the son of God, why don't you tell these stones to become bread? Jesus didn't even try to come up with an answer. He quoted scripture and said, the Bible also says, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Three times Jesus quoted the word of God. He says, I have instructions to follow. And it might be hard, but I'm holding on to what God has said. I'm not going to go with the easy way. I'm not going to take the shortcut. I'm going to do what God told me to do. And you can do that too. Memorize that word. We talked about that in the Saturday morning Bible study. Get it inside you so that you can be careful to obey everything written in it. Another way God tests us, one of his many testings, is responsibilities. He gives you, uh, he gives you responsibility and checks to see what you're going to do with it, Right? The most obvious one that Jesus talks about a lot is money. No? If you will be faithful with little, then you'll be faithful with much. He'll give you some money, hopefully, right? Some of us are still, I'm still waiting on that one, right? He gives you some money and then waits to see, okay, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be faithful? Because the one who is faithful with little and money, even a million dollars of it, is really nothing compared to spiritual riches. Are you going to be faithful with that? Because if you can't be faithful with money, then how can I trust you with spiritual things? How can I trust you with my people if I can't trust you with 20 bucks? Right? Will you be faithful with what I have entrusted to you? Jesus said so. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Those little things. That's why when people are just getting on their feet, and we've got people who are just getting on their feet, and I love how God provides and gets people housing and gets people jobs, and he will do that for you. But whatever he's given you, be faithful with what he's given you. Take that little bit and be faithful with it. And God, the one who's faithful with little, faithful with more, not just money, but spiritual riches. That's what it's about. Another thing, God will give us, I believe this, certain situations he will send someone to you. He will send you a person and say, how are you going to treat this person? Because if I can't trust you with one person, then how am I going to trust you with a hundred? 
No? I believe in our own church, and I've seen this over and over again. God give us particular situations, and I've seen our pastors and Pastor Roberto and the others discern God's testing us here. What are we going to do with this particular situ- with this particular person? And Jesus said, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Big things start as little things, as one person. Will you love this person? Will you treat this person as Jesus himself? Now, there's other ways God tests us, and this is where it gets kind of tough. Suffering and temptation. The Bible says in Isaiah 48.10, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. That's the tough one, especially temptation. Sometimes, and this is going to sound crazy, but sometimes, not just once or twice, but a few times in the Bible, God cuts loose the devil to tempt people. Can you believe that? What did Jesus say to Peter and the apostles? Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you like wheat. And apparently Jesus said, yes, you can. But he prayed for them, or at least Peter, that his faith would not fail. What happened in the book of Job? The devil well, uh, comes up to God and appears before him and says, well, he, he loves you because you treat him so well. You've given him all this money. You've given him big fame. You're, but but, if, but if, you t- if you take some of that away, just he'll curse you to your face. And God let the devil at him, but within limits, within limits. Sometimes that happens. In the book of Revelation 2.10, we talked about this a few months ago, Jesus speaking to a church that was about to go through persecution, he said, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. If he knows they're about to suffer something, why not just stop it, right? (laughs) I have an idea. How about you just stopping the suffering before it happens? But no, Jesus warns them, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison and you will be tested. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see, the devil might think he's trying to trap you, but I'm allowing a test that will strengthen you and end up in your glory. Now, he doesn't promise them it's going to be easy. He doesn't even promise them ultimate, he doesn't even promise them earthly deliverance. He doesn't. We need to face that. But he ultimately promises them that you will win this trophy. You will be in glory if you stay faithful even to the point of death. The devil's action ends up serving God's intention. Okay? I stole that from somewhere. The devil's action ends up serving God's intention. It's not easy. Well, God's classrooms can be tough. You know what his favorite classroom for testing was throughout the Bible? You know what his favorite place that he liked to bring people to to test them? Anyone know? The desert. The desert. And anyone ever been to a desert? Yeah, I, I have a couple of you have. Atacama up there. You've been up there? Yeah, yeah. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of nothing, you know, for a long time, I guess, I hear. I see in books. Deserts. Well, when the people of Israel escaped from slavery in Egypt, God didn't bring them immediately into the promised land. First, he brought them through the desert. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, God explains why at the end of 40 years of desert testing. He said, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. Why? Because it was the only way to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He tested them in the desert. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet, your shoes lasted. God was a pillar of fire behind them and cloud in front of them. He took care of them in the desert to teach them that he is their provider, that he is their protector. You can only learn that in the desert. 
can't learn that in a green pasture. The green pastures are good because the Lord is our shepherd. He makes us lie down there. But there's some things we can only learn in the desert. You can only learn that God feeds you when you're hungry. And then you learn that my God can come through for me. Now, Jesus did this too, didn't he? He had his apostles one day in a desert place. Okay, It wasn't a sandy desert, but it was a deserted wilderness place. Tens of thousands of people, men, women, children, came out to hear him teach. It was getting late, too late for them to get back to town to get food. And so Jesus turns to one of his apostles, Philip, who was from that area. And look at what Jesus says in John 6, verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, the Bible says, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. How about that? Jesus knew, hey, you know, I'm going to do that bread trick now. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to multiply the bread. But before I do, let's see what these guys are made of here. And he asked Philip, isn't this, this is just malvado in a certain way. It's kind of in a, in a, in a, like in a tough coach kind of way. He's tough. He picks Philip. He picks the guy who's from there who might be be most likely to think of natural solutions. And he said, Philip, what do you think? Where should we buy people for these people to eat? You know, you're from around here. And you know what Philip does? He fails the test. Because Jesus lets them squirm for a while. God's going to let you squirm for a while. He's not mean, but he needs to let you struggle. You parents know. You coaches know. You coach soccer, coach baseball. You parent your kids. Your teachers. They, you know if you give the kids all the solutions, if you make it too easy on them, they're never going to grow. They're never going to learn anything. Sometimes you just got to let them wallow in it for a while. They got to figure it out for themselves. And you're saving them all the time isn't going to help them, Right? And so, uh, so Jesus lets Philip struggle a bit. And he says, it would take more than a year, half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. But then comes Andrew. Andrew is a secret hero in the, in the 12. There's a few moments where Andrew pops up and does something really beautiful, and everyone forgets about it, but Jesus didn't. And he comes in verse 9, and he said, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far is that going to go among so many, you know? And so, uh, you know, what does Andrew do? Well, he brings what he has. Now, why did Jesus, and then he, of course, multiplies the, the loaves. And the way he does it, Jesus doesn't just do it. You know, he gives the bread to them, and they distribute it to the people, because I want you to touch this miracle. I want you to remember what you've been through, because there's going to be other moments in your life when you're going to face a huge multitude of people, and I'm going to command you to give them spiritual bread, and you're not going to know how to do it, and you're going to think you can't do it, and you're going to squirm, and you need to remember what I did here, that I'm the good shepherd, that I make my people sit down in green pastures. I feed them. I prepare a table before them in the wilderness. He says, you're going to need to remember to just give God what you have and trust me to multiply it for you. That was an object lesson. He put them through a learning experience. He let them suffer a bit because he knew they had to learn. Now, I don't know what your desert is, but I know that you've been there before or you are there now or you will be there again in the near future because even Jesus went through the desert. You're going to go through a time of need. You're going to go through God's classroom. You're going to go through his training. And you're going to have a decision to make. Am I going to resist this and harden my heart? Or am I going to open myself to what God wants to teach me and give him what I have? In the book of Hebrews, uh, the Lord speaks very clearly to his people. He says, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. During the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. The people of Israel, instead of embracing God as their provider, complained and rebelled and grumbled, and they tested God instead of letting God test them. Soften your heart. It's a faith walk, and it's going to be hard, but it starts with one little step. Who is the father of our faith in the Old Testament? It says that Abraham as the father of our faith. Well, it all started with one little step. 
God told him, you need to leave everything. Leave your family, leave your household, leave your country, and go to the land that I I will show you. Abraham had to trust God enough to leave everything without even knowing his destination. The book of Hebrews says, Abraham obeyed and went even though he didn't know where he was going. Now that's a test. Trusting that God will lead you even though he doesn't give you a full map of how you're going to get there and what's going to be the destination. You're just going to have to trust him to guide you step by step and say, God, I don't know exactly where I'm going, but I know that today I'm going to do this to follow you. And I know that tomorrow you'll guide me in my next step. Amen? And over time, through testing and failures, and Abraham had a few failures, just ask his wife Sarah, you know, sister Sarah. He had a few failures along the way. And then finally, though, he builds these faith muscles through these testings. He learns that God is reliable. He learns that he can trust God until finally comes the ultimate ultimate final exam where God appears to him. And it says clearly in Genesis 22, verse 1, that God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. I will show you. But how, how could God ask someone to do something like that? How could, and the promise had been made that Isaac will be the, the, the son through whom you will have other children that will become a great nation, and through that nation, all nations on earth will be blessed. Every promise God has ever made to you depends on Isaac. And now God is saying, let, let go. Let go. How could he possibly do that? The book of Hebrews explains how. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. You see, he had been through so much, he had seen God do so much that he said, my God can do anything. (laughs) He can even raise the dead. What saves us today? Faith in God's power to raise the dead. In Jesus being raised and us being raised with him. He had been tested over and over again. He had seen God come through over and over again, and he knew that God was faithful, and he was willing to go through with it and watch God raise Isaac from the dead. Now, don't try that at home. God did that once with Abraham, and then he did it once with himself. Amen? Amen? Talk about a spectacular comeback, right? Dead and buried, three days in a tomb, and then alive again, and then exalted to the right hand of the Father and pouring out the Holy Spirit. Now that, that is quite a comeback, amen? Like Moses, we want to be people who can say, I've met God in the desert, and I have seen him appear in fire and smoke and come through when I didn't know how. I've seen him make war on the Egyptians. I've seen him separate the waters. I've seen him give bread in the desert. I've seen him bring water out of the rock. I've seen him thunder from Sinai. I know from experience that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so that is how, when you are tested, the Apostle James can say, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and perseverance will finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God's letting you be tested because he loves you, because he's got a purpose for you, because he has a destiny for you to fulfill. And there aren't going to be any shortcuts. He's willing to do it the hard way. He's willing to make you sweat. Because he's a father who disciplines his son. We are like gold tested in the fire who prove what we're made of, who prove that God is faithful. Because Jesus himself is that tested stone. And anyone who trusts in him will not be put to shame. As you're tested, you discover God in new ways. When Abraham was tested to offer up Isaac and then God provided a lamb, he learned that God is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He will provide a lamb, no? 
I, I think of Jacob when he wrestled with that angel all night and was tested in that way. He learned that my God is El Elohe Israel, the mighty God of Israel. Amen? He met God in a new way when he was tested. When we're tested, we see him new. I think of Joseph in the book of Genesis when he was in prison. God had made him promises of greatness, and here he was rotting in jail. But that's where he learned that my God can make all things work together for good, even when it looks dark, no? God will do it. Desert training. We learn that God is a warrior. We learn that the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Jesus himself was tested in the desert, in his life, by enemies. He was tested in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweat blood. He was tested on that cross, and he came through it shining like gold, seated at the right hand of the Father. You will be tested, but I want you to be motivated by the fact that it's worth it. Because the harder the test, the sweeter the victory of receiving that trophy, no? It says in James 1.12, blessed is the one who perseveres under testing, under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That victory, that award ceremony is one looking forward to. The harder the test, the sweeter the glory. Job himself, you know what he said? He said, the Lord knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. You will shine like gold because of what you're going through. Trust Jesus. He's doing a good work in you. I invite you to stand with me. And I'm going to invite you to, to, to join me in this prayer where we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to do whatever he needs to do to refine us like gold and make us the men and women that we're called to be. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are a faithful teacher, that your testing is your teaching, Lord God, that your testing is your training, that it's not punishment, Lord God. It's for our formation. It's for our strength to make us shine more beautifully like Jesus, to help us trust you more. And God, I thank you that you are faithful in the desert. And I pray for the people in this room who are in the fire right now. They're in the furnace of affliction. And God, I thank you that even when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in that fire, you didn't leave them there alone, Jesus. You went in there with them and you took them out. And God, I pray that you would be with your people in the fire, Lord God. That you would be with your people in the desert, Lord Jesus. That you would speak your hope to them and teach us that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. You're our provider. You're our God. You're our Father. And even though you seem harsh sometimes in what you allow, I thank you that you love us, Lord, and that you care about what we're going through and that you're going to bring us through shining like gold. So search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.